Forrest Carr is joining us. You know Forrest from the afternoons. You might know him from in town, from running K-Gun a couple of times and all that. But I want to say, before we get into anything, now you've got to go into the realm, and you've done it for a couple of years now, and, and something else that people say is near impossible to do, to be a successful writer, um, have the discipline to write, the really talent to be able to write good enough. You always knew you could write, but to write good enough to write fiction, which is a whole different thing. They're much different from news. And to be doing a show here and then somehow having time. Now, now you're gonna you're working on your third, and you've only been really doing this in earnest for two years? Yeah, not quite two years. I, I decided in March of 2013 that I'm going to give myself a, a sabbatical, which I said at the time would be up to two years, just to pursue some lifelong dreams, do some things that I'd always wanted to do. Because do. as you know, Jim, you've been a television news director. It is an all-consuming job. It takes 24-7 you have uh, you know that communications device on your hip. Back in the old days, it was mm-hmm. a pager. Then it morphed into a cell phone. You are never off duty, really. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you're when you're not at work, you're at home monitoring your newscasts, writing up notes, you know, doing whatever. Uh, you're always on call. So I, my, I, my, the time that I had to devote to writing, which earlier in my career I did some on the side, later in my career. It just went away. Even as a hobby, there just was no time for it. No time to get a train of thought going before it would crash into the ravine because your pager's gone off, your cell phone's gone off, or whatever. So I just decided, I'm going to do it. This is something that I've always wanted to do, and I had worked for it. It was not something that I did just on a whim. Uh, You know, the wife and I don't have kids, so we we saved our money. And I said that, uh, you know, I'm just going to take these resources, and, and with her full support, uh, do this for a couple of years and see what happens. I am am going to write at least three novels. This is what I said to myself. And the first two I'm going to self-publish, which I did. Um, and one of the things that motivated me, Jim, was that you know I have a, a lot of colleagues in the news business that um, – you know, you often think that you'll wait till retirement to do the things you really mm-hmm. want to do once you have time. I have and a lot of colleagues. Die. They weren't making it, right? Yeah. They just yeah. weren't making it. I had a close friend of mine uh, who owed me an email, and I'm waiting for the email to show up in my box because he was usually pretty good about writing me. And um, I wake, I, I get up one morning and read in a trade magazine that he's died in his sleep. And people yeah. here know him. This Randy Garcia used to be an anchor over yeah, at KOLD. Randy was a friend. Yeah. yeah, he's a friend of mine. And uh, just in his sleep, and he's five years younger another guy was a writer uh he he gave me a collection of his short stories some years ago i still have it on cassette tape from back then but and and you're so right with that because you look at uh, obituaries and the average obituary i don't know there's no facts behind what i'm saying but you see 72 78 whatever if you see it in a tv trade it's 52 i mean it's never something (laughs) like 90 i mean it just isn't and we all know that i just told her about anxiety attacks and things i went through i mean unlike even this business, where I have to go to bed thinking of it, waking up thinking of it, listening to the station all day, doing all that, still doesn't compare to having bosses in TV. And they right. would, you were supposed to have seen the 6 a.m. news, the 11 p.m. news back east 11, um, and everyone, even if you had producers or anything else, you personally say, well, you, you didn't see it, Forrest? You know, you had that kind <laughs> yeah, of pressure, right? right. you got to so, watch it all the time. There's a lot of news product on the air these days, around the clock, and you're supposed to be omniscient. And a lot of news directors do that. They'll call, they'll call the newsroom at 3 o'clock in the morning. I knew one that was a news director at WCBS, and he used to just – he would, he would uh, call the newsroom at 3 o'clock in the morning and just say, hey, what would you do, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they would go, wow, he's up at 3 o'clock. Well, actually, between me and you, no, he wasn't. He set his alarm to get up to call the newsroom to make them think <laughs> that he was, you know, never slept. But still, it gave that impression, and that's what news directors are supposed to do. It's an incredibly high-pressure, high-demand job. So I, I just never got a chance to pursue my – my writing desires for fiction uh, as a TV news director. And after doing it for 33 years, I just said, you know what, I'm going to take a break. Now, I don't know if they'll ever let me back into TV news or not, but I, I know I know TV news directors who've been convicted of felonies that went on to be TV news directors and had another job. So I, I think probably I can get back in if I want to. I, I would think so, but I, I have some questions for you. Um, not only about the actual books, and we'll get into that too, but how did you discipline yourself not to write but to write in the same voice. A few times I've played around with fiction or whatever, and if you read what I wrote Tuesday, I sound like a certain guy. Right. And then Thursday, I sound like a different guy. <laughs> you know? And they're both decent writing, but they don't match. I mean, how do you speak in the voices? Now, I do understand how you develop characters and you know how you can write for them. But how do you, like, some days I would write more flowery, and then other right. days I'd be more like Hemingway with short sentences. Um how did you find your fiction voice, I guess? Well, for one thing, I, I have a real good sense of who I am as a person, so that's number one. 
And then number two, I just made a decision. You know, my style is going to be very straightforward. One of my idols that I would like very much to be like is the, is the science fiction writer Robert Heinlein. He had a very plain, Midwestern, uh, straightforward, non-prosaic voice. And he could be prosaic when he wanted to. In fact, one of his, fav- his most famous stories he wrote poetry for. It's wow. uh, The Green Hills of Earth, and it was uh, Reisling, uh, the poet of the space w- spaceways. Actually, was, uh, some of his poetry was quoted, I think, on Apollo 14. But, um, uh, but so that, you know, I'm not poetic, per se, but I, can, I know how to write a grammatically correct sentence. So I just said, I'm going to tell a story. So I brought a journalistic approach to it. So my, my approach, and depends, points of view depend, you know, you, when you sit down to write a novel, you have to make a decision of what your point of view is going to be. Is it going to be omniscient? Is it going to be first person? Right. And all those things. So I'd make that decision, and I'd just say, okay, this is going to be very straightforward. It's going to be telling of a story. So then the, uh, the emphasis, the important thing, became to come up with characters that are going to be memorable. And um, believe it or not, uh, a lot of those characters just create themselves. They demand to be written. They just suddenly they appear in your head, and they start speaking to you. And that's, that's how you know that you've got a story in you is when the characters start speaking to you and demand to be heard. And you can't wait to get it out, right? Just and you like can't you can't wait. wait to go read. You can't wait to go. Now, your first book was, was a um, rough, honest portrayal of the TV news industry. Yes. And it was fiction, but not really. <laughs> it's, uh, it's fictionalized. But I would yeah. say that you know, most of, almost everything in there is inspired by reality. And some of the things were written exactly as they occurred, just the names have been changed to protect the guilty and the goofy. And people think, oh, come on, that, that really couldn't be how it was. And, and now the business is crazy now, but th- this might be one of the few industries that might have been crazy, crazier even a few years ago before people were paying attention to what was going on in newsrooms. Well, the, the interesting thing about that novel, and the name of it is Messages, uh, is that it, it, I said it in the 80s, and I did that, I did that deliberately because that was a time – in which, uh, number one, it was the golden era for TV news, which we've kind of lost now. TV news is not nearly as important, not nearly as empo- as powerful as it used to be. Back in the old days, if you were a consumer of news, you only had a few sources. You had, might have radio news if you had a good, strong talk radio station in your market. Uh, you, might, you had your morning newspaper, maybe an afternoon newspaper as well, and, and up to three broadcast choices, and that was it. Mm-hmm. So television news, your local television newscasters were king. And what they said was incredibly powerful. And a battle was underway at that time for the soul of TV news. And uh, not all of those battles were won by the good guys, I'm here to mm-hmm. tell you. So that, this, this novel shows off some of those battles being fought, some of them being won, some of them being lost. And all of that basically set the stage for what we have today, for better or worse, as TV news stands today. Yeah, you don't mind me saying for worse. Uh, but some of the comments <laughs> a lot of time, a lot of times, yes, it is for words. author Carr does an exemplary job portraying the media circus surrounding the comet and the possibility of flesh eating mobs okay <laughs> um, now now this is uh, these are some of the uh, so this is what i 'm trying to get to. How do you get from real life newsroom stuff fictionalized as you put it to a journal of the crazy year now now Valerie, who you 've worked with right. and obviously we, we all know each other well um told me that even when you're doing crazy fiction stuff, you're doing it from a this-could-happen factual way in some ways. You you pulled something that, that happened many years ago that you could see happening again. I mean, it's fact-based. Right. So, But then you went off with it, right? Right. So how, how does this, I don't want to say much about it, but how does this develop? Well, the Journal of the Crazy Year is, is, is the next logical progression in what I was trying to do as a writer. Messages was very reality-based about TV news. But then I started as, as a journalist. I just got interested in certain societal trends. One of them, in fact, Valerie and I started noticing this when I was at K-Gun. We kept an informal uh, clipping file of just really weird, bizarre stories, some of them violent, some of them not. Uh, the, a violent example would be the naked guy a few years ago that, that attacked a man, I think it was in Florida, and ate his face. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, just right. strange stuff like that. And then you would have strange things that were happening that were nonviolent but just weird. You know, like some guy urinating on passengers in a bus or at a bus station or a couple on an airplane uh, having sex on an airplane in mid-flight. And then the steward tells them to stop, and they don't. You know, just really weird, yeah. weird stuff. And after, you know, 33 years in the news business, I'm here to tell you that those stories weren't common. When I first started in the news business, you probably remember this, and, and that, then they became more and more common. So then the question became, as a society, could it be possible that we are just going crazy? So then I wanted to write this, this, uh, this end-of-the-world story. So 
the other thing I wanted to accomplish is, you know, in, in, in popular series like The Walking Dead and a whole bunch of zombie novels that are out there, they all have one thing in common. Zombies uh, almost always are somebody who has, been, who has died and then is suddenly walking around again, right, with its arms out going, grr, right? So, but it requires a suspension of disbelief in, this, in the sense that you, know, you can't have someone who was dead get up and walking around again. If you do, it would be really big news. So I posed the question of, would it be possible to have a plague strike that had those kinds of symptoms uh, and have it be based on something that's real? And I found one that, yes, it is. There was, a, there was a disease that struck 100 years ago. It's called encephalitis lethargica. And a lot of those victims suffered zombie-like symptoms, and some of them were hyperviolent. So then the question, and, and this, this disease, they didn't have a cause. They didn't have a cure. They didn't even have a method of transmission. It didn't seem to be directly contagious from patient to patient, and yet people were getting it. It affected a million people across the globe, and then people forgot about it because right after that, uh, as people were, as the epidemic was reaching its height, the Spanish influenza of 1918 hit, and then encephalitis lethargica more or less got forgotten about. Uh, it went away without any human intervention. It just disappeared. When do you ever hear of a disease doing that? It just it just morphed and went away. Common sense did that. Yes. Yeah. You know, so it's just it's so then. Uh, since we don't know where it came from, we don't know where it went, uh, logic dictates that, you know, it could come back. And what if it were to come back in a much more virulent form? So you take that and you take the societal trends that we see in front of us right now, and then you mix in a little bit of journalistic experience, because I, I know what the media circus were to look, would mm-hmm. look like if the world were to end today, because I'd be one of the guys writing those mm-hmm. stories, right? So you mix all of that in, and you have what I hope is a very realistic portrayal. And then finally, I layered in a little bit of theology, uh, man's relationship with God, and raises the question, you know, would God allow catastrophes like this to happen, and how could a just and merciful God do that? Um, you look into human history, and there's strong evidence to suggest that civilization-ending catastrophes have happened before. So they could happen again. So what does that say about the relation, you know, man's relationship with God? Well, the, the lead character in the book has a does have a relationship with God, and he makes a bargain with God, and I won't say anything more about it except to say that there's a religious theme in there that really does talk about this kind of thing and tries to reconcile all of that. Well, and, and you know through personal experience, and I do, and most people now, that um, we've changed what we think might be the downfall of our health because viruses are getting stronger and stronger, and they, no one can stop them, and anybody who's been in a hospital recently, and uh, you more than most of my friends can attest to, they can't stop a lot of this stuff, and it's getting scary. And if you don't talk to any doctors and nurses and things like that now, they go, oh, yeah, it's bad. Yeah. You know, I just had a weird thing happen to me, an infection. And they're all saying, oh, this is like every day now. So it's the, way worse. One of the things that uh, I tried to do with the book is to get that ripped from the morning headlines feel from it. Well, this summer, Jim, uh, actually it was this fall, I, I picked up the paper, and um, I hadn't been paying much attention to astronomy issues recently. But I picked up the morning paper, and a, a comment had sneaked up and, on me that I didn't know about, but it was just now making the popular press. It's a co- comment called Sighting Spring. Now, in the novel, I have a comment. And it, it's really never explained in the novel what the comment has to do with anything, although there are characters in the book that think the comment has a lot to do with what's going on. So, so the comment is part of the, the story in the novel. And then also in the novel is, of course, this plague. So I pick up my paper in October of last year, and first of all, what's making headlines? Ebola. And so, you know, I have the afternoon show here on Power Talk 1210. A lot of my listeners, one of my listeners in particular, kept referring to Ebola. This is like an episode out of The Walking Dead. This is like an episode, of, and it really is in a lot of ways. So you've got Ebola, uh, which is, uh, is just a really frightening plague. And then suddenly you have this comet at the same time making headlines in the paper. In my book, my comet makes a near miss to the planet Earth. In reality, the comet in the morning paper was making a near miss to the planet Mars. In fact, the tail of the comet, uh, Mars passed through the tail of the comet. Wow. It's just a bizarre coincidence to pick up the paper and see, I mean, almost right out of my novel, here it is. My novel, in fact, I, you know, the first draft that was uh, basically on the boards a year ago, I wrote about things like, for instance, flash mobs attacking people at random. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was before we had that very thing happen in Memphis where a mob went through the parking lot and just started attacking and, and knocking people. unconscious yeah. grocers. I had the mysterious disappearance of an airliner uh, under circumstances that raised questions about maybe the pilot 
uh, had something to do with this. This was six months before the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. So a lot of things in the book have turned out to be uh, weirdly prophetic, and, and, and that's why Kirkus Review said, uh, you know, this, this, this novel makes a, a case that not only is the end nigh, uh, it might already be underway, which I thought was great. I loved it when Kirk, Kirkus Reviews said that, because, of course, now I'm using that in all my marketing. No, of course. And that's any time you get any line. And I, I'll, I'll read some of those, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. We have uh, Forrest Carr with us. And if you want to jump in, 750-7456, and we'll be right back. 55 minutes after 9 o'clock, sitting here with Forrest Carr. See, the show goes faster when I can just sit here and talk to somebody. So it's, much, <laughs> it's awfully nice um, of you to have me on, did, by the way. Did I really it under, appreciate the, it. under the guise of trying to, to get some publicity for your next book coming out. <laughs> i, I, I got to tell you, i got to give you a lot of credit for just, just getting it done. And, oh, and a lot of people here are saying fantastic things about your writing. But as a, as a friend and a fellow journalist, just making it happen is, is so, so hard. I, I give you... A, a little bit of an example, and I'm, I'm, I'll never be able to do it. Um, all of us in journalism always want to write something, right? So um, I had um, boxer Macho Camacho stay in town for three months. We shouted him. We were doing a reality show, planning on doing it. Never got around to it. He's crazy. So he, like, left town for some girl in Vegas, and, then, you know, it all fell apart. Well, I had tons of videotape, tons of quotes and sound and all this stuff. And I said, you know what? I should put a, put a book together that's just the fight experience, and Val designed the cover, and I got writing on it, wrote 60% of it in about a week. Then that's it. <laughs> and you know what happens with me? And here's what I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you something. The perfectionist takes over because journalists are like that. And I can't make the decisions I need to make to sew it up and finally get it out. And until it's like a term paper and you say, all right, the heck right. with it, I'm yeah. done and I'm done. How do you discipline yourself to say, yeah, I'm happy with these pages, I'm done with the book. I'm, uh, now, before I try to change another word, I'm getting it out there. Was that hard? Yeah, it, it actually uh, kind of is. But I did this, uh, the first draft of, uh, of messages. Actually, I had been tinkering with the, the story off and on for many, many years. But uh, when I became a news director, which happened in 1997, I pretty much had to give the project up because, as we discussed earlier, being a TV news director That's is such it. an all-consuming mm-hmm. thing. So when I took my sabbatical, the first thing I did was a road trip. Hey, road trip! So I went and saw some friends that I'd been wanting to see for many years. Took 10 days to do that. Then I came down and sat down and picked up the novel and started it again. And I had to completely rewrite it from top to, from top to bottom. Uh, but now, you know, many more years down the road in terms of having experience as a news writer, uh, I, I knew a lot more and could sew up the story better. So first draft took four months to render. And then I went through a second draft and wound up making a lot of changes, wholesale. And then I went through a third draft and wound up making more changes, still at the wholesale level. And then the fourth draft, now I'm making retail changes. And then, okay, fifth draft is it. This fifth draft is just going to be proofreading for typos, right? No, more changes. Mm -hmm. And I wound up doing many, 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 many drafts. When I knew it was ready to go was by, I don't even, I lost track of the, the number of drafts, but I finally went through a draft where I did absolutely nothing but fix typos, and then I knew, okay, I'm ready. So then I did another draft to find typos and another draft after that, and then I published. And found out even after I published that there were still some typos in there, but I had knocked them down like 99.99%. And then you let friends or acquaintances or whatever read them, and everyone's going to say nice things. But finally, you got real people to say nice things that do this for a living, fresh thinking, uh, heartfelt Stuffed with character-driven, great dialogue, sincere investment in the concept of people. I mean, I mean, really good stuff. My professional review. I hoped, and, and with journal, a Journal of the Crazy Year, I had uh, delayed the publication of the print version like a real publisher would do in order to submit it to professional reviewers with the hope that I would be able to put quotes on the print cover by the time I finally pr- uh, printed it. And that indeed happened. I got quotes from Publishers Weekly, which is the gold standard. I got... Put quotes from Kirkus Reviews, which is another gold standard. All right, so but you know what? All this stuff won't that. matter if you can't tell them where to buy it. So go, tell them where to buy yeah, it. Yeah, go to Amazon.com and just search my name, Forrest Carr, F-O-R-R-E-S-T-C-A-R-R, or go to www.forrestcar.com. Either way, uh, book links are there along with reviews and a free sample chapter. And I'm going to actually have to read this now. Yeah, now so you do. As busy as I am. I got <laughs> Forrest, good luck to you with this Thank book. Thank you so I appreciate much, Jim. It very, very much. I really Don't appreciate it. Don't forget to listen to Forrest right after John C. Scott this afternoon. We'll see all of you tomorrow. Some great guests on the show tomorrow, so don't go anywhere.